and we are live. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. We are just waiting as people continue to fill into the room. We'll get started uh, shortly. All right, it looks like we are uh, starting to level off in terms of people joining. So um, just really quickly, I'll introduce, we have Matthew Rappaport and Jeff Berkman of Falcon Rappaport and Berkman and Edward Renninger of SES ESOP Strategies. And with that, uh, Matt, I'll kick it off to you to get started. Appreciate it, Moish. Thanks a lot to you and Alan for putting this webinar together behind the scenes. Um, and they're the, they're the true architects of today's program, but we will be joined in addition to my partner, Jeff Berkman, who is our firm's head of corporate and securities, we also are privileged to have Ed Renninger today from SES ESOP Strategies, which is, of course, a Stevens and Lee uh, Griffin company. And Ed is an expert in the area of the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or the ESOP. What is cool about today's presentation is you get to see the ESOP strategy from the business succession angle. Uh, as Ed, I'm sure, will explain in great detail, the cool thing about ESOPs is they represent the one-way exit strategy. And for a lot of business owners who are looking to exit from the company, but don't quite have a convenient way to do it through succession in the family, succession to a key employee, or, or they don't want to go ahead and sell to an outside acquirer, it's a really, really good solution. And it's tax efficient. So... That, we will get into that in the program today, but this is the spiritual sequel to a seminar that we gave about a year ago during the summer and is very well received. So we're really happy to put this new twist on it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matthew. I am the vice managing partner of Falcon Rappaport and Berkman PLLC. We're a law firm that is based in New York. We really pride ourselves on handling complex interdisciplinary matters across a really wide range of practice areas, and that will include tax and trust in estates, otherwise known as private client, where I head the department. We do a fair bit of income tax work as well, I might add, a lot of real estate income tax work, 1031 exchanges, opportunity zones, partnership taxation, and things of that nature. And we also handle a taxation of mergers and acquisitions. We also have as, as other featured practice areas, corporate, real estate, litigation, intellectual property, campaign finance, and elections. And in addition to that, um, we will do litigation related to tax, trust and estates, real estate, and business and commercial. So we like to put a lot of minds in a room and the way we feel we really distinguish ourselves is we will work together, you know, unlike a couple of other places where you might find the departments to be siloed and not really communicating and talking to each other. For us, we really pride ourselves on the idea that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. I will leave it here for Jeff to further introduce himself as well. Thanks, Matt. Um, just take a minute. Um, as Matt did as usual, an excellent introduction of the firm. Jeff Berkman, I had the corporate securities department, um, typical corporate work, uh, including outside general counsel, working from startups to merging to well-established and well-heeled companies. Um, significant amount of uh, mergers and acquisition activity uh, and uh, as well as fund formation, you know, working with primarily real estate assets as an asset class in the funds, but not only. 
And we do in that context as well, in other contexts, general private placement offerings, uh, primarily Reg D, but you know, other types as well. Uh, we are a full service corporate securities department. And as uh, Matt said, you know, we're multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. Um, and that's how we work. So all our departments work together when we're doing these transactional corporate planning work. Thanks, Matt. And now for Mr. Renninger. Thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate being able to join um, your, your webinar this morning and talk about what, what appears to be my only area of concentration, which is ESOPs. And it's actually a true statement. It's pretty much all that I do um, day in and day out. And it, it, it drives really a, a whole group of us here at, at Stevens and Lee and um, at SES. We have got a team of eight lawyers that are 100% focused on ESOP transactions of some sort or another and a group of five investment bankers that are also wholly focused on, on ESOP transactions. And, and that, that ranges from helping owners set ESOPs up, thinking about whether or not an ESOP is a good fit, to um, continuing to, to run the ESOP after it's been set up, and, and in some cases, selling companies that are ESOP owned to third parties. In fact, I, I'm working on one of those transactions right now that's supposed to close tomorrow. So it's a, it's a wide ranging group of uh, transactional practice, but I'd say a good probably 70% of the practice is focused on the business owner and helping them think through whether or not the ESOP is a good liquidity event for, for the owner. Very good, thanks a lot, Ed. So, so what type of uh, lawyers would we be without a standard disclaimer, right? General information, not legal or tax advice, please do not rely on this and run out and try to implement anything that we're saying here without the assistance of a qualified professional, preferably us. Um, because all of this is meant for your own edification. I do say on here that, that right, remember that regulations are coming. That's sort of standard because of how much tax CLE and CPE that I do. But at the same time, uh, regulations could come out that could change anything related to this content. So especially if you're watching this on tape, uh, you never know whether or not changes in the law may affect what we're saying. So you have to be careful with that. And then finally, uh, please do not use any of this to market anything that we are saying. While it is certainly not meant for you to rely on it for your own purposes, it is definitely not meant for you to uh, run around and market this content to others. So what are we gonna to cover today? First, we're gonna get into fundamentals um, and talk about the key questions related to business succession planning and what we feel are overlooked basics that advisors may skip or miss or not give enough attention to when they're engaging in their own business succession planning. Then uh, tax advantage transfers, and this is where we get into the meat of the ESOP and how it can solve not only business succession issues or non-tax issues, but it can also solve tax issues quite well. Then we will get into buy-sell planning, which for the FRB side, Jeff and I, is going to be the heart of this presentation. And then finally, we will end with asset protection planning. There's a lot of opportunity for asset protection planning in business succession. Some folks are aware of that, some folks aren't, but no matter what, it always seems like it is one of those ancillary concerns that clients always are interested in whenever the subject is raised. If, if the clients may not have it top of mind at the very beginning, but when you bring it up, clients always turn around and say, hey, you know what? If we could make something better from an asset protection point of view, why don't we do that? So we will also cover asset protection, but I will say this, in the event that we do end up pressed for time because uh, we will take you until um, at least on the East Coast, 11.15 a.m. today. If we don't have time, asset protection will be on the chopping block. So maybe we don't get to it, but if not, then at least you'll have the slides that will convey some of the concepts that we have there. So let me begin first and foremost by talking about what questions need to be answered in order for a business succession plan to be successful. First, you have to answer as, as both the business owner and the advisor, who is going to take over the business? There are a couple of different possibilities here. And we have said three of them in these hollow bullet points in the middle of the slide. Do you succeed to family members? Of course, that presupposes that family members are working in the business. But when it comes to the markets that we all deal in, that's relatively common. So there are certain special considerations for when family members take over the business that would not be the case, say, if your partners or the children of your partners, for instance, are the succession plan instead. Or if you have multiple unrelated persons who own a business together, in the event that one of them passes on, the others may step in. That's pretty common as well, it comes with its own set of considerations. Then you have folks who don't own the business, but we call those key lieutenants. Those are the employees 
who are vital to the business, who have an ownership mentality, who may not own equity at the time that you're doing the planning, but they're going to own equity either through the normal progression of things based on their performance and based on their importance to the company, or in the event that an unexpected, unforeseen event happens and business succession plan is all about addressing that stuff. Once you've figured out who's going to take over, then you can formulate the right exit strategy, right? And then Ed, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the ESOPs last, so you can um, you can take that content and you can run with it. But the first thing is, you know, you have sales with a third party buyer or a competitor, right? There's the notion that you know what's popular right now is private equity. We have engaged on both sides of the aisle in terms of acquisitions. We've represented both sellers to private equity and the private equity acquirers of businesses. And given the amount of uh, what you might call dry powder or available capital for private equity to come in and make an acquisition, pretty popular. Um, if you're passing down the key lieutenants, the question is, what are you going to do in terms of the key lieutenants coming into the business? Will you award the equity to them? Will you sell it to them or will you do co some combination of the two? In the event that you are trying to make a friendly award of equity, the problem is that you can't really give employees equity as a gift. When you see a lot of mom and pop and small market businesses approaching tax advisors, for those of you who are on the front lines of that stuff and you get these questions, you have probably heard more than once in your career. Well, you know, the employee has been very, very good to me. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to award her with equity in the company. Let's just go ahead and say 5%, 10%. And they turn around, and they say, given the employee's prior contributions to the company, I'm giving the award of equity without any buy-in, quote unquote, sweat equity. And given that my estate is, is so far under the new revised exemption amounts under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I'm going to go ahead and transfer that as a gift. Here's a the problem. There's a case called Commissioner versus Duverstein that basically says you can't do that. In any situation in which a business owner is transferring equity to an employee uh, in recognition of past services rendered or perhaps prospect of future services rendered. That is always compensation. It is not a gift. So the problem that you have is that the employees receiving equity as a quote unquote gift are really gonna be hit with what's known as a phantom income tax. You have an income tax liability, but you don't have the cash to pay it. That's nasty. So we'll go over the different ways that you can structure around that and make it a lot more friendly for, for an employee to succeed to equity without a tax hit. And then as far as family members, to family members, you can gift, even if they are employees, there's an exception for that, right? You can gift equity in the, in the company to family members. And because they're family members, you have what's known as the quote unquote, detached and disinterested generosity on the part of the gift giver that would be required to treat it as a gift for tax purposes. So family members are an exception to that, not employees, but if they are family members and they happen to be employees, then you can make a gift. Then there's a bargain sale, right? Bargain sale is sort of the in-between between, between uh, a gift and an arm's length sale at fair market value. Any uh, gulf between fair market value and the actual sales price, that's a bargain sale, right? That part's treated as a gift. So uh, you may hear bargain sales referred to as part sale, part gift. Alternatively, family members can receive equity as compensation. And if you structure that in the tax advantage manner, that could be good for the family unit because if somebody is over the uh, estate and gift tax coupled exemption, and the exemption is really going to eat them alive uh, in the event that they have a taxable estate and they wanna save that exemption for stuff other than the equity in the company, which, which could receive valuation discounts, passing stuff down as compensation could be useful. Ed, here's what I'm gonna tee up for you in terms of the ESOP. In family units, have you seen situations in which um, the family actually succeeds to ownership of the business through the ESOP? Yeah, uh, great question. Yes, yeah, so, so ESOPs are uh, very different, right? I mean, it's a very different type of a transaction. When you sell to an ESOP, what you're doing is you're selling to a trustee. You've created effectively a buyer out of whole cloth by creating an ESOP trust, which is a type of a retirement plan. And because it's a type of a retirement plan, and we'll get into the, the weeds a little bit on this, it effectively is a broad-based benefit program for your employees. And so because of that, ownership is not concentrated in the ESOP, ESOP, generally speaking, to just a few key people. Now, family members can, in some cases, participate in the ESOP, but they're just going to be one of many participants. So what we have seen work really, really well in a family transition is what happens a lot of times, right? If you're going from generation two to generation three, 
there might be some fear or risk on whether or not that family succession is going to be successful in the long run. You have employees who have been working there a long time who may not have buy-in with the third generation on an emotional basis. There's a lot of anxiety over whether that's going to be a successful transition. So what we've seen were really, really well in those types of situations is maybe what we do is we, we sell maybe 25, 30, 35% of the company to the ESOP from G2, from generation two, and then they transition the rest of the business down to generation three. And what that does is it, it creates this mindset where, where the employees now all of a sudden have a real upside in the potential growth of the business through the ESOP and makes them much more inclined to want to welcome the third generation as the, as the new owners in a way that, that, that might be a, a better transition and make it more likely to be successful than you're, if you're just doing an intergenerational transfer. So, so that's one of the tools we've seen used in an ESOP transaction a lot. So, so why ESOP at all, right? Why, why would people even consider ESOP absent that type of a scenario? And the answer tends to be for, for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, some, some businesses don't have family members in them. And so they're sitting there, they wanna maintain legacy because it's been in the family for a long time. So they don't wanna look and sell to a third party buyer, maybe a private equity or a strategic competitor. And so they're thinking, well, the ESOP might be a good way for me to maintain legacy. And it does a really good job of that, but it's also an, an exceptionally tax efficient business transition. It permits the business owner if structured properly to actually avoid paying any capital gain tax on the sale of stock to the ESOP and still get paid full fair market value on the sale. From the owner's perspective, that's obviously very beneficial. From the company's perspective, the worst case scenario is that effectively with the liquidity the money is generating to buy out the owner through the ESOP, we can prepay, we not prepay, we can repay that to the bank using pre-tax dollars rather than post-tax dollars. Again, super beneficial, right? Normally in a transition, when you're borrowing money from a bank, if I borrow $10 million to, for example, do a dividend recap and pay it back out to, to the owner, you're repaying that with post-tax dollars, whereas in an ESOP transaction, you might have the ability, not might, you always have the ability to effectively repay that with pre-tax dollars. That's worst case scenario from the business's perspective. Best case scenario is we actually might be able to create a 100% a tax-free operating company if we structure the transaction properly using an ESOP. So big picture, there's huge tax benefits and, and a legacy of play usually when we're, we're doing an ESOP transaction that ultimately is benefiting the owners. And if you're coupling that with intergenerational transfer, can can hopefully you know smooth the transition to the next generation at the same time. Helpful to know, but take us through from the ground level, right? Basic mechanics of an ESOP transaction. Assume that everybody listening is totally uninitiated, yeah. right? I'm a business owner. I want to go, I'm interested in setting up an ESOP. How would the transaction work step-by-step? Step? Yeah, no, fair, fair enough. So, so it's, it is a very a different type of a transaction because as I mentioned earlier, an ESOP is a type of a retirement plan. So retirement plans are subject to their own set of rules under both the tax code and, and a body of law called ERISA, which governs um, fiduciary duties as it relates to retirement plans. So what we effectively do is we create a trust an ESOP trust, which is a retirement trust, as a tax qualified retirement plan um, that generates some tax benefits in using this ESOP structure, which I'll get into the weeds a little later. But we create this retirement trust that has a trustee. So we have a trustee who's responsible for negotiating on behalf of the participants in the ESOP, which are effectively the employees of the company. So we create this trust, we appoint a trustee, and then we negotiate an arm's length negotiation between the sellers and the trustee over the value of the shares we want to sell. And the beautiful thing about an ESOP is, is it's super flexible. The owner might only wanna sell 10% of the business and retain 90% of the ownership and have effectively complete control on a day in and day out basis post transaction, or they might wanna sell 100% of the business to the ESOP. So we're, what we're usually doing is we're figuring out goals and objectives of the business owner to try to come up with a transaction structure that is most likely to accomplish their goals and objectives. So we're figuring out what's the value of the business. We're figuring out what the debt capacity of the company is. We're trying to figure out how long the owner or owners may want to stay involved in the business when we do the transaction. We're thinking about how we want to finance the, the transaction from a senior debt capacity, whether we want to have the, the, the seller take back some paper and, and sell or subordinate a debt in the transaction. So we come up with this whole transaction structure, hire the trustee, and then we negotiate with the trustee over the terms, the key terms of the transaction. 
And then when we get to the end of it, right, we're, we're negotiating with banks to raise debt facility with the transaction. And when we close the transaction, what typically happens then is that the cash we, we, we borrow from a bank is used to fund the payment at close to the owner who gets their cash now. And then the ESOP ends up owning the stock in exchange for all of that. There's a lot of documentation that comes in added. There's a purchase agreement. We're doing financing documents. We're negotiating all that with the bank, the trustee, the, the selling shareholders. But ultimately, at the end of the day, once we close that transaction, cash goes in the seller's pocket. The company has a debt obligation to the bank and perhaps to the, the, the um, seller as well. And now the ESOP owns the stock that used to be owned by the seller that was sold. And that stock over an extended period of time, what is going to happen is it will slowly be allocated from the ESOP into the individual employee counts over time it is a proportion of their compensation. So that that gives the employees the ability over time to start start getting real value in the share, in the form of shares of stock within the ESOP. Yeah, well explained. So that's I mean that's um, the foundation for what will be a deeper discussion on the ESOPs as we go along. And in addition, considering for me, I'm only so well versed in the topic myself, I'll be sure to definitely chime in with further questions on the technique, because I imagine that that is a big reason why almost everybody who's attending today is here. So that's very, very helpful. Um, third thing we wanna cover in terms of, of fundamental questions and, and laying the groundwork for a business succession plan. Sure, you wanna identify folks' goals and objectives. Um, Ed mentioned that in connection with ESOP planning. And then of course, what may get in the way of it, right? Which, which we are fortunate from experience to understand with different pathways to business succession, different things come up. And then the thing we try to urge folks is even at the time of formation, when we're drafting governing agreements, when we're drafting operating agreements, shareholder agreements, when we are getting the governance structure together for even a company that's getting off the ground, we really try our best to get business succession provisions into these things from the beginning, because the issue is that the majority of business succession events are unplanned. And the problem that you have is that if an unplanned occurrence happens at the wrong time and there is no advanced planning in place, you can basically kill the business. So business succession truly is, even though it's an issue having to do with retirement planning and if everything's orderly, you end up going into the sunset with a nice smooth transition. It's also a life or death issue in terms of, is your business truly prepared to not have you around anymore? And that's an easy thing to stress test, by the way. You could, even with a thought experiment, you could ask folks when you're speaking with them, what do you think the business environment would look like if you weren't even there? Well, how do you think the business would perform? And for a lot of people, it's not too well because the founder or founders are typically the most integral parts of the business and the business will be rudderless in the event that one of them or, or, or heaven forbid all of them are, are not around anymore. So, okay. So in terms of who is taking over, right? We talked about the different possibilities when we listed them a couple of slides ago. Let's talk about the notion of, of family members taking over. The biggest thing we try to do when it's a family business succession is avoid disputes. A lot of people say, well, you know, the biggest source of disputes would probably be if multiple family members who would succeed the founder work in the business. Sure, that's obvious. What's not as obvious is the notion that if you have multiple family members, some of whom work in the business and some of whom don't, you'd be surprised how much trouble the family members who don't work in the business could cause for those who do. Even if the family members who don't work in the business are not bequeathed any equity or gifted any equity or anything else along those lines, there is the overall resentment that occurs when the family business is the crown jewel of somebody's legacy and it only goes to certain family members. And those bad feelings are just as important to a lot of clients as the notion of the business surviving. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that all the family members are on the same page for how this succession is going to go, not only in terms of governance, but also in terms of the value of the business itself as a going concern. So that's really, really important. If you're not selling out to a third party and instead you're selling in to family members or you're even gifting or you're making some other transfer that doesn't involve money in the founder's pocket, how do you meet the owner's liquidity goals? All right, because it's all well and good if you turn around and say, well, you know, my children are not going to need the 
money, uh, you know, or, or rather we, they shouldn't pay to get into the business. They should be bequeathed the business. They've worked in the business a long time. It's, it's, you know, they're heirs to my estate. They should also get the business as part of my estate. And why should they have to pay for it? Well, the problem that you often run into is if you don't have your income from your business as a source of liquidity, if you're retiring, where is your retirement money coming from? That's a question for the financial advisor, by the way. And for those of you who are on the program today, who are in wealth management or who are in insurance advisory, or perhaps do both under the same roof, this is an analysis for you. This isn't an analysis for us, the attorneys, and this is typically not an analysis for the accountants to do. This is something for the financial advisors to step in and advise the business owner about. For a lot of times, most of the business owner's net worth is actually tied up in the equity of the business as a going concern. So at the end of the day, you want to make sure that the wealth advisor is a part of the team. It's a multidisciplinary team with, with many professionals on it. And, and the wealth advisor has a big role. And part of that role is making sure that the liquidity situation is there. In addition, you want to make sure that there's liquidity in the business. If the business is redeeming out the founder, if the business is otherwise saddled with obligations, you want to make sure that the business is going to have enough cash flow to survive. The business, when it's passed down to other family members, those family members are going to want to make, want to make sure the business grows in the future. They don't want to be handed a business that's saddled with so much debt that it's either stagnant or worse comes to worst, it's in trouble and it might be shrinking. Nobody wants to deal with that. That is more of an accountant's question than a wealth advisor's question. Certainly not a legal question. It's, it's a question about dollars and cents. It's a question about doing a financial analysis. So that's where the accountants step in. And then finally, in terms of corporate governance, you wanna make sure that business operations are smoothly transitioned here. I mean, Jeff, you wanna step in for one second, just talk about you know, some basics in terms of you know, the types of documents that we put together to make sure that business operations are gonna go smoothly from one family member to another and the types of arrangements that you can do things along those lines. Absolutely. I'll just take a couple of minutes. Um, one thing that I would say on all of this is certainly, and we touched on this a minute ago, is, you know, failing the plan is the issue. So um, really, in terms of dealing with family members, this is paramount. I, I was involved with a scenario once many years ago when I was just a junior, junior lawyer, uh, where the where the lawyers uh, and the partners had spent a lot of time and money planning a family succession and kind of came to the time of the closing and uh, we noticed that the person, the, the family member who was gonna take over the business just seemed completely disinterested. And it turned out he was disinterested because he had no interest in actually being in the business. And so as a result of that, they had spent lots of time and money uh, with lawyers and financial planners and accountants figuring out how to do this, but never asked the key person or persons who were involved whether they even wanted to take over the business. And so they didn't plan in the right way. So. Matt's, you know, earlier comments about failing to plan is the problem, uh, certainly when you're, when you're dealing with business succession. Now, in terms of how you deal with family members, the big question is, if you're going to have the family member involved, how does that happen? Over time, in other words, are you going to sort of ease them in, uh, him or her or both or several, you know, several of your family members, or are you going to hand over the business in one, you know, fell swoop? Um, so that's a big question. And if you're going to do it over time, what does that look like? So we draft documents where the family members or family members may be getting it over time. Often the, the, the person or the family, you know, the, 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 key, the, key, the father, the mother, you know, whoever it may be, the uncle who built the business will wanna retain control for that period of time until he or she is no longer in the picture. And so to keep that in mind, what we basically do is we can actually structure this in a way where by control, I mean control over the major decisions. So they may want to allow the, you know, the son or the daughter to run the business on a daily basis and not get into the weeds on certain issues, but major issues, they would want them involved. They would, they would want to make a decision on you know, obtaining financing or whether they could sell the business or issue new equity, you know, bring on new partners. And so in the documents that we prepare, we address these issues so that the, the the, you know, the, the, the father or the mother or uncle or aunt who built this business can retain control. Um, so a lot of what goes into this in this documentation is, is thinking about how you're going to go forward in achieving the goals in terms of the short term and in the longer term planning. And that is done through the documentation and understanding what the relationship that the, the family member was handing over the business wants to continue to hold over the business. 
So and that is, continue. yeah, that's an overview in terms of families taking over, right? Now you've got, what about the other business partners? Okay. The business partners, there's different considerations when it's unrelated persons who are taking over the operations. Mostly, this is going to happen based on a life event, death, disability, retirement. Commission of a tort is overlooked, but commission of a tort could be pretty big. I mean, for instance, our law firm, in our operating agreement, we have certain provisions in there that say you are eligible to be expelled, even though you're not automatically expelled. You're eligible to be expelled by vote of the partners in the event that you commit legal malpractice, in the event that you commit sexual harassment, in the event that you commit any sort of uh, discriminatory employment-related action, things like that. Those could be very, very important, even, even vital to certain businesses, and the professional services are a great example of an industry with that. Simple impasse between the partners, right? You could be at the point where the partners, uh, and, and this happens uh, more often than you might think, the partners just don't want to be in business with each other anymore. They have come to an impasse based on so many issues or even one key issue. Uh, they, they just can't be in the same room with each other anymore and they need to disentangle while maintaining the viability of the business's going concern. That's a tricky thing to draft in in advance, but we do have techniques to address that. And we'll get into that later in the content. Restrictions on transfer. Owners want to control who they're in business with, even when it comes to each other's families. The reason why we have the word unexpectedly in the slides is because in the event it's, you know, let's say just Jeff and I have a widget business and not a law firm, which requires licensed ownership. But if Jeff and I have, have Matt and Jeff's widgets and uh, I get hit by a bus and I die, then my equity in the widget business goes to my heirs at law. Jeff may not even know my heirs at law. He may not even know them that well. So why does he want to be in business with those people? They'll also have full voting rights. They'll make all sorts of other decisions and they could potentially get in there and meddle with the business to the point where they kill it. Or they could ask for such an unreasonable price to be bought out that Jeff is now tied up in court and all sorts of other legal proceedings you know, in negotiations and things along those lines that he didn't sign up for and it takes away from his time to run the business. So you would, there's restrictions on the transfer of the equity. Then you wanna preserve business liquidity. I mean, for example, if you've got somebody who is amenable as an heir at law to being bought out of the business equity, where is the money coming from? If somebody unexpectedly has died or somebody has become disabled and that liquidity has to come from somewhere. That's where the insurance advisor comes in. So that person may be separate from the wealth manager. That person may be uh, you know, the same person as the wealth manager, but one way or another, you need an insurance expert to put the insurance in. Everybody, everybody hates the, the, the insurance discussion, right? But at the end of the day, it is the closest thing you're going to get to the magic bullet. Because if you don't have the insurance around, it's going to be very, very painful. And then finally, of course, you're preserving the operations, but in a different way. You are preserving governance in terms of, okay, four unrelated owners, one of them dies. How does owner number four's you know, the deceased owner's responsibility gets split among the other three. That has to be decided in advance because you could imagine that if the folks are, are having any sort of disagreement, um, there's going to be some real difficulty in operating the business going forward, especially with respect to the deceased owner's particular responsibilities. Jeff, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, so this goes back to the same thing we've discussed before, but the idea of having that agreement, whether it's an operating agreement or a shareholder agreement, is going to address more than just simple issues of current governance, but also what happens like restrictions on transfer, for example, Matt discussed um, in the event of death, disability, and a number of triggering events. Matt mentioned one that often is overlooked in professional license businesses, like if someone loses their license, but it could be you know, someone convicted of a crime. I mean, most people don't wanna be in business with someone who's sitting in jail. The, um, you know, it could be in the event of divorce because you don't want to end up with a spouse having being being your partner. So all of these issues are addressed in governing documents between the various partners, um, because the end result is if you don't have it, you can end up with someone as a partner that you really don't want as a partner. And the biggest problem, and then I'll turn it back over to Matt, is that particularly in New York, but I'm sure it's the same in others, in, uh, you know, to a certain degree in other states. New York is a very difficult state with respect to business divorces. If you don't like your partner, you can't just go and form another business and walk away. Um, you know, even if you're a minority owner, the problem is, is that the business divorce 
unless it's dealt with in the agreement and how that's going to be addressed, you end up in court in a protracted battle and you may not even get what you want out of it because New York is very difficult. And that's why you need to you know, prepare ahead of time by having an agreement that addresses both you know, dispute avoidance or dispute resolution and addressing what happens in these various key events. Uh, that's it on that. that. Well said. So let's move to the idea of key lieutenants before we turn it back over to Ed to discuss ESOPs in detail, right? Key lieutenants, ESOPs are related to this, but the key lieutenants going ahead and staying on, key employees, there are times when it's not a family member, it's not an outside buyer, it's going to be persons within the business who have been with the business a long time, who know the business, have contributed a lot towards building the business to where it is, and those persons are best suited to go ahead and take over. Key directives that you have here, if you're going to plan for a key lieutenant to step in, number one, person has to stay, okay? There is a little, little bit of a limbo when somebody is a key lieutenant of a business and you want the person to take over, but you don't believe the person's quite ready for equity or you as founder are not quite ready to go ahead and transition any part of the equity. If the lieutenant doesn't get the equity, however, the lieutenant could very well leave. It leaves you vulnerable to a larger competitor going ahead and offering a more lucrative compensation package. So the thing is, right, you, you have to decide on the method, which includes both the nature and the timing of any equity transfer. As I mentioned, Duberstein says gift is recharacterized as compensation. You can't do that. But there are multiple ways that you could set up a transfer of equity. An award of equity can be done in multiple ways. It can be done through the granting of stock options. In the event that you are a corporation, um, you know, incentive stock options, non-qualified stock options, employee stock purchase plans, and other sorts of you know, restricted stock units, for instance, under Section 83, turn around and tell somebody, you know, I'm going to go ahead and grant you stock, but the stock is subject to vesting conditions. These are different ways that you can keep a key lieutenant aboard, but also address the key governance and, and other sorts of comfort related issues for the business owner or founder to make sure that you're legally protecting the founder. In terms of a sale, right? The sale could be a fair market value or the sale could be below fair market value. Instead of a bargain sale to a family member where the uh, delta between the sale price and fair market value will be a gift, here it's going to be considered compensation. You could go ahead and based on the tax consequences, if the business has the proper liquidity, you could bonus out to go ahead and, and true up or otherwise equalize the recipient of the equity to make sure that that person can also meet the tax burden. And that's another thing that you can do. From the insurance side, right? There are a couple of strategies here that are really, really good. They work very, very well. 409 cap A, uh, using that with whole life insurance. That's our preferred method. You don't have to use whole life with, with 409 cap A, non-qualified deferred compensation. But that doesn't involve giving equity at all. That involves setting aside assets as deferred compensation subject to a vesting schedule. As long as you follow the dictates of section 409 cap A, which are really not that onerous, you can go ahead and you can keep the key lieutenant aboard by dangling a large amount of non-qualified deferred compensation. Other insurance related strategies, section 162 executive, executive bonus plans, right? They work super duper well in C-Corps and those are available in the event that that's your choice of, of uh, tax organization. So you have a couple of different things here in terms of what you can do to keep key lieutenants on board, but they have to stay on board. If you don't have a, the key lieutenant, the business succession plan flies out the window. Then there's the notion of easing the lieutenant into governance. I did talk about vesting, but then there's the notion of, listen, in the governing agreement, you may want to have a, you know, a full-blown employment agreement, or you may want to put this into the governing documents of the entity itself. As the lieutenant gets eased into operations, what are they doing? So, um, Jeff, chime in for one second here and talk about the different ways that you draft this in. And then once Jeff has said his piece, we will turn back over to Ed on the east side. Yeah, just a couple of quick points. The the thing that you have to recognize is when you do, is really when you bring on any equity owner, whether it's a partner you know who's outside the business, or in particular, like we're talking about here, is a key lieutenant or someone who's in the business, is what's that vesting schedule look like? Um, there should be clear milestones, and we usually combine this with a combination of an equity grant document that you know the, the, that defines what the terms are in terms of what equity they're getting, how much and what the vesting schedule, but also an employment agreement uh, that, that also ties in as, as well. The other point about this that people fail to forget or th think about is what happens if that person leaves? Generally, 
kind of like what we are said earlier, you don't want some some third party now owning an interest in your business that no longer has any uh, involvement. And so you want a clawback as well. You want a scenario where you can take that stock back where the or the membership interest, whether it's on fair market value, whether however that's done, you can preset this in the agreement. So the key is thinking about this person as a shareholder or a member in an LLC, what are the rights? How do they get the equity? How, what do they have to do for performance? And if they don't perform, what's your right to, to take that back? The last thing you can consider is maybe they don't even vest over time. Maybe they only vest on a particular milestone, like a sale of the business. And the reason you might want to do this is so that they can, you can continue to control uh, all of the equity until a major event occurs, which you can define. So the key points are equity vesting, how it's done, tying that into the role of the person who's doing it, the key lieutenant, and then what if they leave, uh, being able to call that back. Excellent. Tagging Ed back in. So let's talk about the notion that if you want employees to step in and take over your company, ESOP, the ESOP strategy represents a great option. Tell us more about this. Yeah, sure. Right. So if, if you're looking to have your key lieutenant come in what, what we often do in an ESOP structure that by far and away the most tax efficient lucrative process for a business owner is to sell in one transaction 100% of his his or her equity to, to the ESOP um, but then that raises a question I told you earlier remember I said that that ESOPs as a retirement plan are designed to be broad-based and so within the ESOP the people that get the benefits are all your employees now it's done in proportion to compensation so your key lieutenants who earn more money are going to have a larger stake within the ESOP. You do it as pro rata to comp, but but even if you're doing it as pro rata to comp, it, it still doesn't probably get enough equity value to your key lieutenants at the end of the day to really have that that kind of owner alignment that you're looking for from your key lieutenants, right? Because you want them to be thinking long term about growth of the bottom line because that's going to inure to them and make the business grow and be more productive. So what we'll often do in an ESOP transaction is we will actually set aside a, a slug of synthetic equity usually. Maybe it's a stock appreciation right, maybe it's a, a restricted stock units of some sort or another. It's, it's compensation like Matt was talking about earlier. And we have to satisfy 409 cap A if, if we're going to make it deferred compensation. But the bottom line is we can set aside maybe 10, 15% of the fully diluted equity value of the business outside of the ESOP for the benefit of the key lieutenants. And even if we, we do that, we can still, because the ESOP is the direct equity owner, we can still create a tax efficient structure at the end of the day. Um, way into the weeds here, but if we, if we have an S corporation for tax purposes, that's 100% owned by an ESOP. An ESOP is a tax exempt retirement trust. And so that normally in an S corporation, the shareholders are paying income tax on the profits of the business on an annual basis, both for federal and state purposes. So, so when you have a tax exempt retirement trust that owns 100% of an S corporation, what you've created is a tax-free operating company. We don't have to make tax distributions anymore to the shareholder because the shareholder doesn't need to pay taxes. It's a tax exempt retirement trust. So in that scenario where we have synthetic equity set aside for the key lieutenants, 10 to 15% of the fully diluted value, but the direct equity is owned by the ESOP, we can come up with a tax-free operating company that can be really, really beneficial in the long run to the value of the business because you're throwing off a lot more free cash flow every year. And so those that 10% equity value in the long run is going to be worth more than 10% equity value than it may be in a in, in a tax operating company, right? In a C Corp or an S Corp that has non-tax exempt shareholders. So it's it's a wildly tax efficient structure that can lead to a lot of benefit to the to the key lieutenants over time, in addition to what they're getting inside the ESOP, which is also a tax exempt retirement trust. Ed, basic question. What if I'm taxed as a partnership? What do I do in order to take advantage of the ESOP strategy? Yeah, yeah. Good question, Matt. So so uh, partnership right maybe you're an llc tax as a partnership or um, you could be a sole prop llc disregarded be, entity right? right what do i do in order right. to structure myself into the esop uh, technique yeah so 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 that that is a little more complicated but can also actually be be somewhat um tax advantageous it gives us a, a planning opportunity so an esop must own common stock that's one of the rules unfortunately so so as a retirement plan, there's a lot of rules we have to follow. And one of those rules that Congress put in place is that an ESOP must own common stock. So if we have LLC membership interests, if we have partnership interests, that doesn't work for an ESOP. We need to somehow or another get the LLC or the LP in, into a corporation. 
Usually we're going to do that in, in some sort of a tax advantageous <laughs> um, reorg that doesn't in the reorg trigger tax to the, the holders of the equity pre, pre-conversion to a corporation. But there's a lot of tax complexity that comes with that because th- we, we have to be cognizant of the fact that they might be selling to an ESOP at a later point in time. So we want to really do some real tax planning with people like Matt, with your accountant, to make sure that we're not going to blow up or cause an adverse tax consequence. But, but if we do it right, and we've done this before, if we do it right, we can ultimately end up with a C corporation, do the ESOP transaction, and then end up with an S corporation at the end of the day. And that can permit the selling shareholder to take advantage of that tax deferral I had mentioned way back in an earlier part of the presentation on the sale and permit the company to end up as a, a tax exempt operating company with the S shield in place. Ed, I'll just chime in by saying the main pitfall that you want to look out for when you have either a sole prop or, or uh, a partnership for tax purposes and you want to convert it to a corporation, the single biggest thing for you to watch out for is if there is debt in excess of basis of the assets, that will trigger a tax liability to the extent of the difference. That's the type of thing accountants are going to know about. But if you generally have a pretty financially healthy company that's not too highly levered and things like that, the conversion from a a sole proprietorship or a partnership to a corporation should generally be tax-free. This is not to take away from the complexity that Ed is talking about in terms of planning for this, but generally, so the thing that, that people should be aware of is that the ESOP strategy is available to all businesses, even if those businesses are going to need to do some level of structuring. So, Ed, kicking it back to you here. You want to go to the next slide? Yeah, happy to. Okay. That's great. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so let's get into the weeds a little bit about an ESOP. Um, so, so I've told you several times, I'll say it once again, it is a type of a retirement plan. And, and that means it's a regulated market. ESOPs are subject to oversight by both the U.S. Department of Labor, they're responsible for the ERISA fiduciary part of it, and, and the Internal Revenue Service, which is responsible for the tax qualification parts of it under the tax code. So what that means is we need to be cognizant of that. We need to make sure we're working with advisors who understand those nuances so that we're not tripping over any adverse consequences that, that are, would be unintended when we're doing the transaction. So, so, so with that as background, um, what we're usually looking for when we first start talking to a business owner are some certain thresholds or bench, benchmarks. We don't want to just throw an ESOP into a company where it's not likely to succeed because of that complexity, right? We want to make sure we're doing it right. And that also makes sure we want it, we, we want it to be successful. We want to create a sustainable operating company when we're done. And, you know, Matt mentioned on an earlier slide that, you know, part of business succession planning is, well, how much liquidity does the owner want? And how, how much leverage can the business afford so that the business can continue and be profitable and do what it needs to do to continue to grow? So those are those are super important things, right? So so when we're thinking about size, when we're thinking about scale, some of the things we're looking for is general benchmarks. One, we want the business to be profitable. If it tends to be a, a business that that on a regular basis has you know barely break even or, or even loses money on a regular basis, that's not a good environment for an ESOP because we're going to leverage the balance sheet up. We need to be able to have a sustainable business to repay that leverage. And so we want to have somewhat predictable and profitable cash flows on a prospective basis. So I'm always looking for that in my conversations with owners. We need it to be big enough to support the debt service. We need it to be big enough to justify the transaction expenses. So generally speaking, we're usually throwing around maybe a million dollars in EBITDA as a benchmark, maybe a little less than that when we're thinking about size of a business and whether or not it's likely to be able to, to justify doing an ESOP transaction. Stated another way, we're generally looking for a transaction size of about 2 million or more. So maybe that's a business that generates 500,000 in EBITDA and we're, we're doing a 100% ESOP, or maybe that's a business that is worth $20 million and we're doing you know, a, a 10% ESOP. I don't care as long as we, we get the transaction size large enough to support the transaction. Generally speaking, we're talking 20 to 25 employees at the end of the day. We can go a little smaller than that if we're willing to be a C corporation when we're done. But those are the generally the, the benchmarks I'm looking to see whether or not an ESOP is a viable liquidity event for the business owners. So, so let's get into the weeds now a little bit and go into some more nuance around some of the benefits and the risks. I've told you, generally speaking, it's a business succession tool that can generate liquidity for, for the business owner. And, and the, the, 
the one that is used a lot, especially in high tax states, we do this a lot for California companies, we do this a lot for New Jersey and New York companies, is the ability for the business owner to not pay capital gain tax on the sale of the shares to an ESOP. That takes advantage of takes advantage of section 1042 of the Internal Revenue Code, which is very similar in real estate to a like kind exchange, except it's not real estate. It is a a U.S. operating company. So we have to sell a U.S. operating company. We need to buy qualified replacement property, which is debt or stock of a U.S. operating company in exchange. And if we do that right, we have the ability for the owner not to pay capital gain on a sale of stock, which can be wildly, wildly beneficial to the owner. And under today's tax code, if you hold the replacement property till death, that'll get a step up in basis at death. And therefore, you've effectively eliminated the need to pay capital gain. Now, who knows, right? Um, Biden wants to potentially raise capital gains rates. One of the things that's out there is that they'll get rid of that ability to get a step up in basis on death. So maybe that part of it goes away. But even, even if that goes away, you still have the ability to defer then for an extended period of time, a capital gain event even under the worst case scenario. So that, that is a wildly beneficial transaction. We don't do it in all transactions. I'd say um, it's in a large but minority part of our transactions that 30 to 40%, because in some cases, business owners have very high basis, especially in S corporations. Basics can creep up because they're, they're not taking out all the profits, they're paying tax and every year their basis may go up in that. So it really depends on where the basis is. We wanna model it out and look very carefully on whether it makes sense or not. Um, and then the business owner can make an informed decision on that. And uh, Section 1042 yeah, question, ahead. right? Yeah. Um, I go ahead, first and foremost, right? One of the things, uh, one of the details that I think is important to mention is when you do a 1042 transaction, you take back debt or stock of an operating business. Uh, most often, this stuff's publicly traded, correct? Yeah, um, it is. You know, yeah. Right. So, so usually what we're doing is we're selling stock in a private company. These stops are usually private company transactions, and then they're going to turn around and they're going to buy debt or, or equity and usually public companies, but they have to be operating companies. And it's very easy to think someone might be an operating company when in fact they are not. So you will definitely want to work with someone who has experience with placing qualified replacement property. Right. And once you've, you've secured these public equities for which, you know, within that universe of operating companies, you have a choice. If any of those securities, right, either are interest paying debt instruments or are dividend paying stocks, I can enjoy the benefit of that income even without paying the capital gains tax associated with the sale of my business yep. for the capital that I use to acquire it. So in that way, 1042 is a pre-tax ability to invest right. in the public markets, really. Is, isn't that a correct characterization? Uh, it is a correct characterization, Matt. It's, it's, it's very well summarized. And, and high, high, not only can you do that, right? You get the dividend stream if, you, if that's what you're going to do. But usually if you structure your QRP portfolio right, they're usually highly leverageable. In some cases, as much as 90% leverageable. So just hypothetical transaction, you do a $100 million ESOP transaction, you buy $100 million worth of QRP, but because of the, if you structure that QRP portfolio right, theoretically, I can only tie up $10 million in the QRP investment and generate that 90% liquidity on the rest of it, free and clear, that I can do whatever I want with and not need to worry about. So it, it, it's, when you see this modeled out over a 30 or 40 year period, it, it, it's magical. Um, it, it, it's really impressive. I know who likes that. David in the specialty lending space is on this webinar. David likes the idea of the uh, <laughs> leverage section 1042 transaction. This I know. So uh, that's a, do, do a shout out on that on that front. Um, OK, so um, so so continuing along. Right. Uh, talk about the tax free operation of the business itself. Yep, we, we mentioned that a little bit. I won't beat it up too much. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we're going to get to an S Corp, even if we start doing a C Corp. 1042 transaction, which 1042 must be C. We will, even if we're already S, we'll have to revoke the S, we have to be a C for five years, but ultimately at some point we're gonna end up as an S. And if we're already an LLC or a partnership or a sole proprietor, we might get to an S very quickly. In any event, once we get to that S, tax exempt retirement trust owns a pass-through entity so that the entity doesn't pay tax, we now have a tax-free operating company. So hypothetically, think about it, you're generating maybe 5 million or 10, let's say $10 million of taxable income every year. In the ordinary course, you'd be distributing out three, $4 million to the shareholder to enable them to pay tax on that operating profit, right? With a 100% SESOP, 
that three or $4 million is now going to be retained in the business. You don't have to do those desk distributions anymore. You don't have to do those distributions to the, to the partners of the shareholders so they can pay their tax. That's free cash I can use to repay debt that we leveraged up the balance sheet on. That's free cash I can use to, to pay my executives, my key lieutenants more money. That's free cash I can use to, to buy other companies and grow by acquisition or to do more organic growth. It, it makes ESOP companies more profitable at the end of the day. Some of the other benefits, we create a market for shares when we do an ESOP transaction. We form an ESOP trust, we hire a trustee, and voila, we've created a, a buyer out of, out of whole cloth. So that's kind of cool. Um, you can still maintain real legal control um, or in many, most cases, operational control, depending upon how we structure the transaction while still getting liquidity out of the business. That works really well. You know, Matt mentioned earlier, you a lot of times these privately held companies, the, the value of the owner is tied up in the business, right? They, they may have been pulling out tax distributions to make tax payments. They may have bought a nice house, but other than that, most of their value is going to be tied up in the business. So we do a lot of transactions where someone's, you know, 60 years old, they're not ready to leave. They want to keep running the business but they want to take some chips off the table, we'll sell 20% to the ESOP, 30% to the ESOP, do it in a tax-free free transaction. They get their liquidity out of the business, still control it at the end of the day, still keep running it, but now they're getting liquidity. And now we have a buyer for a potential future transaction, or they could still transition the rest of it to, to the next generation or to key lieutenants or to a third party. We haven't closed any doors, still get some, some chips off the table. So I think that pretty much covers it on this slide, Matt. Excellent. Okay, so covering briefly the notion of a, of a third party sale. Um, it's the first and foremost, you probably as business owner have no idea how to view your business through the lens of a prospective buyer. This is where both the lawyers and the accountants and then if there's a business broker involved, right, because if you don't have a person at the ready, you're going to enlist a business broker or, or a, a, a mid-market investment banker. Really, it's two sides of the same coin. That professional is going to come in. They're going to start lining up buyers. First thing you got to do before you even get buyers to take a look at the company is to make sure that there's due diligence there and to make sure that from the corporate point of view and from the financial point of view, everything is actually ready for review by an outside party because there's you know, ultimately what the founder uh, you know, what the founder was willing to tolerate. And then there's what an outside buyer is going to be willing to tolerate in terms of the state of affairs. Jeff, this is, I know this is near and dear to your heart. I mean, talk about for a second, what type of preparations the business has to undergo in order to actually be ready for sale. The way I like to phrase it is basically do due diligence on yourself before someone does it on you. And that really applies in both the exit, you know, to a third party or even bringing in a partner or I'm sure this, you know, to a certain degree in terms of ESOP or whatever succession planning you're doing. Um, the reason you want to do that, particularly in a transaction where third parties coming in to buy your business or you're raising money or you're bringing in a new partner is that the questions you're going to get uh, reveal how solid your business is and how successful you can actually work through the transaction. Uh, particularly daunting in any kind of, you know, M&A is you know, anywhere from a couple of pages, depending on how the size of it, to 20, 30 pages of reps and warranties that, that you know, to the lawyer, they've seen them a million times before, but to the business owner, they have no idea how to deal with that. And those reps and warranties are really the heart of what goes on in that transaction as to what the seller uh, is representing to the buyer and what they can be bound by and where their indemnifications and obligations and escrow obligations or whatever else might arise out of that. So being prepared to address those things like, you know, uh, what do your material contracts look like? Is your ERISA plan, you know, uh, compliant? Uh, have you treated your employees in the right way? Have you followed employment laws? Um, you know, uh, are you properly formed at the basic, you know, questions? There's just a series of questions that you need to be prepared for and if you're going to be involved in a, in a transaction where you're going to exit by having a third party buy you, you're better off thinking about that as soon as possible rather than waiting for the transaction, because that really is the aspect of the deal that aside from, you know, some other things like money, for example, that will really hold up the ability to, to exit and to perform a successful transaction. Well said. And uh, the other thing you have to think about is when the buyout is successful, right? 
what conditions, if the owner wants to stay on, or even if they don't want to stay on, what conditions is the owner ready to accept? If they want to take back a consulting or employment agreement in order to assist with the transition where, you know, the earnings from the business may or may not have been subject to payroll taxes, depending on how they're structured. You are now subject to payroll taxes. You don't have the same strategies available to shelter the income that you do inside of a, a, a you know, a business that you own. So are you ready to be an employee or a consultant, or an independent contractor? Um, are you ready to take an earnout? Earnouts are, as, as Jeff and I just experienced on a major transaction that we closed in the fourth quarter of last year, uh, earnouts are nice things to argue over. Um, and they're, they're also subject to a lot of interpretation and they have to be drafted very carefully. And um, there's also the idea they have to actually be hit in order to pay. So earnouts are tricky. And, and if somebody's insisting on one, you have to know how to navigate it. And then if you're being paid with an installment note, there's creditor risk. Are you willing to tolerate the creditor risk? What can you do to mitigate the creditor risk? That's a big thing as well. Pivoting back to, to key lieutenants, right? We talked about the idea, you know, are you ready to part with the equity for these folks, right? There should be really clear communication across all this stuff. Cause Jeff mentioned the family context in which he had that business where there was a lot of preparation done and then they brought the family member in the family member turns around and says, I don't even want to take over the business. With lieutenants, it's probably the opposite. They're chomping at the bit, but you have to be clearly communicating with them to let them know, listen, your future is here. You will get the equity in this business. Maybe there's going to be non-qualified deferred compensation or a different type of golden handcuffs to hold them over until the equity is awarded. But they need to have a very clear impression of what the timeline is and how the mechanics are gonna work in terms of taking over. Then of course you have the governance, right? We did talk about the governance. What is going to happen with the key lieutenant assuming authority, what are they going to have the ability to vote on and not vote on? What are they gonna be their day-to-day -day responsibilities? That stuff we've mentioned. Corporate governance is also important in the family context, right? And there's dispute resolution, which we will have time to talk about in about the seven, eight minutes to conclude our time today. What we prefer in terms of dispute resolution and conflict avoidance, because if you have multiple family members running a business, okay, and there's not a clear hierarchy or there's not a clear mechanism to get the family on the same page, the employees have no idea. You start forming factions at that point. The employees are gonna start picking and choosing winners. That you do not want because you're gonna have what we phrased on here is a severe disruption to operations. In addition, non-working family members, I did talk about this, but there's the vampires versus thieves theory, okay? What happens is, right, if you have a non-working family member who succeeds to equity, okay, then they are entitled to a share of the economic value, both in terms of the uh, going concern value and in terms of the profits thrown off, but they're not doing anything. Right. So the vampire theory is, well, you know, um, the working uh, heir to the family comes in, steps into the business um, and, and looks at it and says, why are all the profits that I'm working for going to the person who's not even working in the business? Whereas the person who's not working in the business may take a look at the working person and the working person goes ahead and may increase her compensation to the point where there's not a lot of profit left. Now the non-working person ver views the working person as a thief, right? That you have to very, very carefully navigate. And that's going to be the last five to seven minutes of the presentation is our preferred method to navigate that problem. Don't overlook, by the way, the total basic of, of, a, of a durable power of attorney. Most of you know this as a really elementary estate planning document. That's fine, except that when you are dealing with potential incapacity or disability, you wanna make sure that the power of attorney is in place. For business owners, that may require two documents. One power of attorney for family members, right? In, in which, you know, okay, you've got a spouse or a child that has no, nothing to do with the business. They get rights to go ahead and make financial decisions for the principal. And then you have a power of attorney for business, which you may give to a business partner. You may give it to a trusted lieutenant. You may go ahead, keep it in a drawer, put it, put it with an attorney and have the attorney go ahead and turn it over to the person who is agent under that document at the time it's being used. That is, is a big strategy here that a lot of people turn around and they view the power of attorney as mundane and, and law by form. That is not really the way that a power of attorney is supposed to work with a business owner. You're supposed to very carefully carve out um, what is uh, what the responsibilities are for the agent holding it. So let's, okay, so let's divvy this up, right? We're going to go five minutes with Ed here to, to get a little bit more 
into the weeds on tax treatment of ESOP, and then we will conclude with the final five minutes. Chime in with any questions that you may have, by the way. We'll be happy to address them if we have time. But we're going to take five minutes on the ESOP part, and then we're going to do five minutes on um, you know, other tax stuff and dispute resolution techniques. So, Ed, take it away from here. Awesome. And we'll, we'll, I, I think it might even be less than five because we've covered most of this stuff already. But I'm going to start at the bottom and just remind everyone that S corporations effectively, if they're 100 percent owned by the ESOP trust, we've created a full tax shield. The other beautiful thing is even if it's only partially owned by the ESOP trust, we still have a tax shield on whatever percentage ownership goes to the ESOP. Um, you still have to make distributions to your non ESOP shareholders and the ESOP and an S. They have to be pro rata, um, but that generates cash that can be used to repay debt. In, in the form of a debt payment back to the company. So wildly tax beneficial. C Corporation, we talked about the 1042, could be a huge savings today. It could be an even bigger savings if um, if the, the current proposals come, come through, which I'm skeptical on, by the way. I don't know if there's enough political support for it, just that's commentary. Um, so, so in any event, 1042 could, could, could be wildly beneficial depending upon how, how things are structured. You, you get a savings at both the federal and the state level. There's a lot of rules we need to follow. That's one of those things we wanna work with the family of advisors, a team of good advisors. We want a QRP advisor. We want you know good legal counsel. We wanna make sure we're, we're working with good financial advisor. When we're structuring the transaction, we're working with, with um, you know, a good accounting firm so that you've got a good team that can really bring a whole holistic solution to the table. Um, the QRP, as we mentioned earlier, has to be debt or equity in US public or U.S. companies, that generally means public, um, but you do got to be careful. There are some publicly traded companies that don't meet it. So, so you got, definitely want to work with a good QRP advisor. But another one of the rules is we have to sell at least 30% to the ESOP. Um, so, so usually if we're doing a minority transaction, we'll, we'll just stick right at 30, but obviously if we're doing 100, we're going to meet that. There are rules that limit the ability. If you sell in a 1042 transaction, you cannot participate in the ESOP after you do that transaction. If you do an S company without a 1042 transaction, perfectly permissible for you to participate in ESOP, even though you sold all your equity to, to the ESOP. It's fascinating. Um, your family members are also prohibited from participating in ESOP if you take advantage of a 1042 transaction. So I, I think we've covered the weeds there, Matt, to, to enough that, that it really matters. Fantastic. Um, so, okay. So moving on uh, in terms of tax advantages, right? Family limited partnerships, family LLCs. 2036, the thing is, you want to make sure you don't commit a foot fault, but 2036 is usually not a major problem. 2036 is a section of the tax code that says, if you retain too much power over uh, an entity that you're operating a business out of, the entire equity, including equity that you nominally uh, gave away to, to family members, could be included back in your estate. With operating businesses, it's usually not the issue. The issue usually on section 2036 comes with... Um, really tax motivated family limited partnerships, which may hold art, they may hold um, liquid investments, they may hold you know, collectibles. I mean, other sorts of stuff that is not an operating business. Um, there are free, three types of freeze techniques. Um, these and valuation discounts are under attack in a bill introduced by uh, Chris Van Hollen and Bernie Sanders. Uh, I share Ed's take on how much political will there is to pass this stuff, but in addition to attacking the step up in basis, they want to get rid of valuation discounts. They have tried to do this several times. The old section 2036C in the early 1990s uh, lasted about two years before it got repealed. Um, they tried to do this with the 2704 regulations in 2017, or even before, I'm sorry, before 2017, those were Obama era re regulations. They were withdrawn under the Trump IRS and those uh, purported to get rid of valuation discounts. And now there's legislation that is gonna come up and try and get rid of valuation discounts again. I don't think that's got much of a shot, but um, you know, we, we're gonna have to keep our eye on it. The other stuff that it would get rid of would be um, tax advantage treatment of grantor trusts. They would zap that out, but sales to grantor trusts are a great uh, opportunity to freeze the value of your business inside your taxable estate. You take back a note, the value of the notes in your taxable estate, the equity that you sold along with capital appreciation on the equity is um, out of your state. And that's pretty powerful, not only because of the freeze, but also because of the discounts. Same idea in a grat, right? The difference with the grat is that the grat has uh, mortality risk. You know, if you, if you uh, die during the term of the grat, the entirety of the, um, the entirety of the grat property is included back in your estate. 
but grass have their advantages. I've, I've gone through some pros and cons on the slide that you can take a look at. And then there is the technique that will definitely not change with legislation that I've always tried to educate people about, and that is freeze partnerships. They're tough to understand. The folks you know, who own businesses and own real estate have to wrap their head around it, but they're so cool. Uh, and if you don't know about freeze partnerships, it's not a freeze partnership presentation today, but at minimum, if what I've done today has turned you on to the idea because you didn't know about it previously, that's good because freeze partnerships are probably my favorite overall estate planning technique. It's just, you don't get a lot of opportunity to implement them. I keep jumping back and forth in the slide movement here, but let's, okay, let's take a look, right? So, all right. Um, we have some ESOP content on this slide, which Ed, you can, you can touch on for a little bit, but here's the way we like to head off disputes, okay? Number one, I see at least three accountants on this program who are at firms with valuation departments. In the event that your clients are doing business succession planning, it is both advantageous to you as professional in building your book of business and advantageous to your firm to name your firm's valuation department as the firm that will go ahead and do the valuation in the event that there is a business succession triggering event and somebody needs to buy somebody out, right? Because you're the firm, given that you do the tax work or the audit work or both, you're the firm that knows the numbers the best. You're the firm that can render the most accurate opinion. Therefore, you're the firm that should get in there and have the privilege of doing the appraisal to determine fair market value when you're doing a related party buyout or a buyout between um, unrelated business owners. Um, the way we like to do this is, you know, name the appraiser in advance and we like to limit valuation discounts to 20% out of fairness. Because the fact is that when you're doing this for, for, for purposes that do not involve the IRS, the, the valuation discounts could go really, really low. And, and we like to go ahead and put a cap on those. We figure 20% is the fairest to both sides. So that's the cap that we typically put on it by agreement, regardless of what the studies say. Um, subpart methods that we don't like, yearly revaluations. We've seen business, we've seen agreements call for this. Nobody ever does them and it ends up having serious problems. Formulas. We will begrudgingly accept these. We do put them in. We just don't like them because they typically don't even reflect fair market value, especially if, you, if somebody has had a particularly good or bad year and a stated agreed upon price. This is terrible. This is an invitation to three plus years of litigation uh, and we hate it. We will not do it under any circumstances. So, um, you know, so those, those are some, some methods that don't work. Ed, tell us about the, the ESOP content you had in mind here. Yeah, yeah, ESOPs. I mean, we're, we're a very different transaction, right? So just keep in mind that when you sell to an ESOP, um, the buyer is the ESOP trustee. The trustee will hire their own financial advisor to uh, value the business, and they will they will um, negotiate on behalf of the ESOP against the sellers. At the end of the day, what we usually see in ESOP deals, um, if we're doing a minority transaction, is a discount of only ten percent. Um, is is fairly typical in in, in an ESOP deal. And so, so that's just kind of one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is once you do the ESOP and it's in place, you do have to get that stock appraised on an annual basis. So the trustee will, do, for privately held companies, will, will do an appraisal on an annual basis because that forms the basis of the statements for the participants. Makes and, sense. There's, there's an ESOP question, by the way, Ed. Uh, yeah, Alan yeah. asked the following question. Clients in S-Corp owns 100% of the firm. Raise the idea uh, of an ESOP. And he was basically saying, well, the ESOP limits my ability to sell the company if I choose in the future. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, 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 I guess I strongly disagree with that. We're, like I said at the beginning of the call, I'm actually working on a transaction right now where we're selling, selling an ESOP company that's owned by the ESOP and it's closing tomorrow. And it's, a, it's, it's well over $50 million transaction. Um, I don't want to tell you the name because- Yeah, you know, Ed, the way I understand it. this, right, is the ESOP trustee does have to approve the transaction but the ESOP trustee, if you get a good deal, the ESOP trustee has a fiduciary duty to, the, to the holders. Yeah. So yeah. they're not going to turn down a good deal. Now, if you sell 100% of your firm, you can advise, I imagine, the ESOP trustee being like, look, this is a real good deal. But the ESOP trustee has total sign off at that point. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. They, they do. They do, right? They have to approve it at the end of the day. They're the stockholder for purposes of the sale of the stock. But a lot of times, right, it's a multi-pronged approach because- we talked about synthetic equity earlier, right? Your management team might have some synthetic equity. A lot of times the prior owner will still have some synthetic equity in the form of warrants 
that we've usually issued in conjunction with their subordinated debt. So you might have on a fully diluted basis, 30 or 40% of the value of the business still outside of the ESOP. So everyone has to agree at the end of the day, but we do them all the time. ESOPs are sold on a very regular basis. The difficult thing is if there is a difficulty, it's the, it's the representations and warranties and who's providing the indemnity there. And rep and warranty insurance has come along to, to really make that a lot easier over the last several years. It's grown, grown. Yeah, look, the way I would phrase it, and tell me if you think this is correct, is, yeah, it, it makes it more of a process. ESOP trustee needs its own counsel. You need different due diligence. It's all, all sorts of other stuff. It makes it more of a process, but it's not going to limit your ability that if you get a good deal, you're going to be able to take it. Yep, that's exactly right. No question. Yeah. Okay, good. So, and so I'll, we... and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll just say one thing quickly on the, on the uh, because we have limited time on the reps and warranties insurance. This in certain size transactions has now become more and more affordable. Uh, and it's something to consider because it eliminates the escrows and concerns about indemnities and a lot of other things that will tie up money otherwise in a transaction. So certainly, you know, Ed, Ed's point is well taken in ESOP, which he obviously knows a lot more about, but generally in any transaction, if it's the size and nature, get your reps and warranty insurer involved as soon as possible if you're at all considering doing that. So let me, let me take about two to three more minutes. If you have to run, by the way, if you're attending and you have to run, no problem. We're at 1115 Eastern time. If you got to run, that's okay. I'm going to take five more minutes to deliver the coup de grace, right? Which is how we plan in agreements for a much more efficient um, method of, of buy-sell planning. We talked about the idea that the valuation firm should be specified in advance. What should also be specified in advance, the terms of the transaction. We like a 10% down payment or the total death benefit under life insurance or disability buyout benefit, whichever is greater, right? So any liquidity that's available from insurance goes straight to the seller. Then the terms of the promissory note, which we write up in an exhibit to the agreement and actually attach to it, okay? We like prime rate uh, as determined by Wall Street Journal or JP Morgan Chase, whatever your preference. Um, we amortize it. You can tinker with the amortization. We typically go 20 years of a balloon payment, but you can fully amortize a 10-year note. You know, we like 10 years because it's a nice balance between doesn't kill the liquidity of the business, but also gets a nice income stream for the seller who needs to live. Um, you know, it doesn't financially cripple either side. So that we like is a nice balance. And we typically make the payments monthly, make some uh, nice little bite-sized chunks. So we, we actually leave nothing to negotiation. Everything is like, boom, right? Triggering event happens, that, that's this slide. And then everything else just flows straight forth from there. And there's no room for protracted negotiations and arguments. Valuation is set up, method transfer is set up, the legal documents are set up, everything is nice and smooth. Then. Uh, triggering events, right? We mentioned the idea that there are triggering events that are often overlooked. Death, disability, and retirement are the most common ones. Divorce, bankruptcy, commission of a felony, commission of a tort, loss of your license, impasse between the partners. This stuff all in our minds needs to be covered. It's just a question of what the motivation is for everybody to, um, to address it. But you should be thinking about this stuff, right? And the buyout terms are going to differ depending on what occurred. Clearly, if somebody dies, you're not penalizing them for that. But uh, if they've committed a felony, they probably should be bought out at a much lower price, right? Um, you know, and, and that's maybe even a par, which is typically a dollar for every unit, something like that, because you don't want to reward anybody for, for committing a bad act. Um, what do we like in terms of solutions, right? Going to run this down very briefly. Obviously, you got life insurance, right? We like setting up a standalone life insurance entity to own the life insurance, and then it'll redeem out the purchasing owners so they can do a buyout of the equity of the operating company over the top. Why? Because that gets you a step up in basis, not through um, death, but for the purchasing owners just by the cost of acquiring. Whereas when you do a redemption, especially in a corporation, you may give up the step up by purchase. So that that's no good. Then... Um, disability. There's really three types of insurance and you should have all of them. Disability income is for personal. It's not for a business, right? In the event you lose your personal income at the owner level, disability income covers that. Business overhead expense insurance covers um, disability income inside the company to cover its ongoing expenses. Disability buyout is also held by the company typically, or it's held by the standalone entity that we like to set up in some cases. Disability buyout is somebody needs to be bought out of the company because they're disabled. Disability buyout is the reservoir for that. Retirement, you can do retirement plans. 
Uh, we like uh, de-equitization in professional firms, right? We, we met with a managing partner of a large professional firm who actually de-equitizes as a mandatory issue because if you have too many uh, older professionals hoarding the equity while they're not working as much, the younger people are not going to stay and continue to grow the business. That's a pretty cool idea for you to consider. Divorce and bankruptcy. You have to make sure that any creditor in a divorce or bankruptcy who comes into a business has to be approved in order to fully join the entity. Because if you don't have that, you're now in business. It's even worse than being in business with family members in an unexpected way. Now you're in business with a creditor. That is especially terrible because all the creditor wants is their money. And then finally, in terms of structure, right? Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go toward, this is really the coup de grace for us. And this is this is where we feel we have put together a little bit of a better structure than you would find in the wild. What do people typically say when they've got business and other assets and then there's children who work in the business, children who don't. Give my business to the child who works in the business. Again, it, you get some jealousy, you get some infighting. Why did that person get the business? We got no share of the business, even though we're your children. That's no good. Um, if the business is worth more, you get complaints from, from the people who don't own it. If the business takes a dive and it's worth less, the people who got the rest of the stuff are in a better scenario and the one who works in the business is, is now upset, right? Well, what if the business uh, rents real estate uh, from a related entity and you, you have ownership of both? Business to child one and real estate to child two. I've seen that done before and that always results in disaster because child two is now child one's landlord. That will never, ever go well, okay? And then finally, divide everything evenly among my children. I talked about vampires versus thieves theory. How do you solve for this, right? Uh, in short, we like put and call options, okay? So how, are, how do these work? The kids who work in the business have a call option. At any time for a state for a valuation determined by a preset valuation firm and on preset terms, they can buy out the children who don't work in the business. They can just push the button, do a buyout. The kids who don't work in the business on the flip side have a put option. They don't have an option to buy, but they do have an option to sell. They can sell to the child who works in the business. They can get the cash if they want. In, 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 a, uh, in terms that don't financially cripple the business. If the kids get along, great, don't exercise the option. If they like the balance that they've struck, even though some of them work in the business and some of them don't, then great. You maintain status quo. And in the event of any dispute, you have the trigger on both sides so that they can just get out. There's the selling side can get cash and the business can continue with the children who were working in it. One of the cool things to do is if you want to boost liquidity, um, you can boost liquidity by doing an islet, right? Uh, if you put life insurance in a trust, the life insurance goes ahead and pays out. That can be the liquidity for either um, the call option holders to buy out the others or the put option holders to, to be tied it over and make sure that they have some money so that they're not constantly complaining for the holders of the call option to get the business in good enough shape to buy them out. So, so that's the solution that we really like. We think it's the best of all worlds and it's a way better solution than the other stuff that people typically put into place. So like I said, that's really the coup de grace. In terms of for us, we are, um, you know, we feel that this is a, it's a much, much better approach. And it typically makes family business succession a lot smoother when you actually have to execute it. So I'm gonna let everybody go. Thanks a lot for those of you who, who, who came on and stuck, uh, stuck this out with us. We really appreciate you joining us today. Here's our contact information. By far, the best way to reach us is by email. So you see all three of us, right? Jeff and I are at FRB. Then you have Ed from SES. Um, you can look to the bottom right-hand portion of this slide for our email information. And you can contact us. You can feel free to ask us questions anytime without any obligation or risk. You can go ahead and, and let us know. And I'm sure a lot of you folks are gonna have further questions for Ed. I am very briefly going to see, Alan has a second question. We'll see if we can answer it before we wrap up. So Alan says, we're the advisors to another company. It's owned by a family trust. None of the family members are active in the business. President has brought two of his family members into the business. Is an ESOP a possible strategy to buy out the existing family trust? That's an interesting one, Ed, if you want to expound on that. Yeah, no question. There's, there's nothing that would prohibit the ESOP from doing that. I mean, ESOP can't pay more than fair market value. So we, it can't pay more than the stock is really worth to, to, you know, those trusts, but it absolutely can buy from those trusts. We do, that's a very common one, right? Maybe you have three owners, one wants to, to, to exit, two will remain. ESOP can be the buyer for the third. It could work really well in this scenario. Gets the family out of something they're not involved in, right? Um, which could be a net win for everyone at the end of the day. 
That's great to know. Excellent. Okay. So um, uh, again, Ed, thanks a lot for taking the time to join us. It was a thanks privilege having, having you here and adding the ESOP content was a huge, huge value add to this presentation. So that's really great. Um, Moish, you want to step in and, um, and, and wrap us all up here and, and take us home? Yep, that's all. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Matt, Jeff, and Ed for uh, sharing all your thoughts. This was great. Um, again, all the contact information is below. We will send a follow-up email with a link to the uh, recording of the, present, uh, of the presentation here. If you would like also to receive the PowerPoint, feel free to send an email to info at frblaw.com or any of the emails you see there on the bottom right of your screen. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it.